Good evening. Welcome back to the 2022 Osterhaven Lectures. I believe almost everyone was here this afternoon, so I'm going to do a very short introduction. The Osterhaven Lectures were established in honor of Eugene Osterhaven, who taught at Hope and then at Western for a number of years and had many passions, including a commitment to Reformed theology. So they are dedicated to exploring the contemporary relevance of Reformed theology. I am going to pray for us and then invite my colleague, Dr. Todd Billings, to introduce our speaker this evening. So please join me in prayer. God, we thank you for the chance to gather again to hear from Dr. Thompson, to learn from one another, to learn from you and through your word. We pray that you will guide our time, help us to honor the spirit of those who have gone before us, including Dr. Osterhaven, as we explore together the significance of theology for this moment. In your son's name we pray, amen. Good evening. I'm honored to help welcome Dr. Marion May Thompson here to Western Theological Seminary and to add just a short introduction to the one that um, was given by Dr. Kristen Johnson this afternoon. I speak as a former student of Dr. Thompson and her husband, Dr. John Thompson, who is with us tonight as well in the area of historical theology. In fact, I can recall many times when people have asked, who are the most influential professors for you in leading toward your vocation? These names are at the top of the list. Dr. Thompson is George Eldon Ladd Professor Emerita of New Testament Interpretation at Fuller. It's there that I had a couple of classes and learned some of the basics, you might say, of historical criticism and languages and different components that go into New Testament studies in a formal sense. But there was also something different about how Dr. Thompson approached teaching and writing about the New Testament that has really stuck with me. And it's, I think, one of the reasons I refer students so often to her work. I think that as I was reflecting on it, in the area of biblical studies and theology, there are so many questions. There are so many um, ways of analysis of uh, the different cultural and historical and different aspects of the biblical texts that we can look at. And it can be really overwhelming and confusing why are we doing this anyway? What are we looking for? And there was a statement that you said over 20 years ago that I'll hold you to, the, even though it's just my memory, so I could, be, I could be wrong, but I've had it come to mind dozens of times. And it actually fits really well, I think, with some of what is distinctive about Dr. Thompson's work. On the one hand, she does careful, patient scholarship. And yet, there's a kind of joy and a certain impatience in, in her work as well. And I think it came about when we were interacting, I was trying to, I was applying to doctoral programs and thinking through different directions and interests, and you said, just keep in mind, all of the most interesting questions are ultimately questions about God. All of the most interesting questions are ultimately questions about God. And so it wasn't saying these other discourses don't matter, but it taught me to ask the question behind the question. <laughs> that the biggest question we can ask is about God. And so I think it's appropriate that um, in your work, uh, 
so much of it has focused on God, which is strangely a fairly rare topic in New Testament studies to focus on in terms of New Testament theology. Um, but for you, the, the sort of boldness and even joy in which this is uh, approached is something that is inspiring and keeps me coming back to your work. Um, because it reminds us that this work is not just about us, but about the God who claims us in Jesus Christ by the Spirit. So let's welcome back Dr. Thompson for her lecture, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Thank you. Well, I, of course, I have no memory of saying that, Todd, but uh, it sounds like something I would say. The good thing is as you get older, other people remember for you, right? <laughs> And you just hope they remember right. I, I said that, did I? Well, if I didn't, I should have. So, uh, hallowed be thy name. So, this, this afternoon, earlier today, we talked about God as Father and explored the character of God as generous, reconciling, trustworthy. And I argued or said that Jesus put his full trust in God and called on his disciples to do the same. God's love and generosity are the warrant for the way in which God's children are to act and to relate to one another. Those who belong to God, their heavenly Father, belong to each other. Together with Jesus, we trust in this faithful God and are to be faithful to each other. So with that address in mind, we now move to the first real petition of the Lord's Prayer to ask how it shapes our understanding of and posture towards God. Hallowed be thy name. Now, I'm sure most of you or all of you have heard some joke uh, about how little kids understand Hallowed Be Thy Name, the, the little girl who said, well, I thought God's name was Howard because we pray our Father who art in heaven, Howard Be Thy Name, you know, and there are multiple variants of that. And, but it makes me think, um, what do people understand when they say, Hallowed Be Thy Name? That's got to be the throwaway p uh, petition in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Um, What's the difference if you don't know if it's Howard or Hallowed? You just say it and on you go, you know. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. It's, this is not a word we typically use in everyday speech. We use it, I can think of two occasions in which I have used it in, recently. One is Halloween, right? We just had Halloween. And if you read Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, you wondered what the heck is a hallow, but it's in her title. So anyway, so the question tonight is to talk about Hallowed. And it does indeed share its etymology with Halloween. I think as many of you know, Halloween is a shortened form of All Hallows Eve or All Saints Eve, the day before All Hallows Day or All Saints Day. And in the New Testament, saint is often used to translate the Greek word hagios, which we translate as holy. Now, we don't have a verbal form for that in English. You know, we don't holy fi or something. So we have to, this happens a lot, gives us problems in translations, but um, so we use the word hallow. Again, not a word that is very common, so it's sometimes tra translated as sanctify or maybe to make holy, but we have a little bit of a problem, but it's the verbal form of the Greek word holy. So the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, asks that something be done by someone to honor or make or keep God's name holy. I'm sure that clears things right up about what we mean. So how is God's name made holy and who is to do it? All such questions, I think, back us up to the prior question, what does it mean to be holy? Now, maybe like you, like you've asked students or parishioners or friends what it means, and I almost always get this answer, it means to be set apart, which is partly true because it doesn't mean just to be set apart, but to be set apart for God. And so that tells us that to ask what it means to be holy, you have to know what it means for God to be something to be holy in relationship to God. So we're not gonna get much help from the lexicon or other places. We have to go to scripture to find out how is God portrayed as holy? What will it mean to be holy in relationship to God? 
So there is a handout again that has some scripture, a little outline and then some scriptures so that you can follow along with the stories that I'm not going to read all of these, but you can get some idea of where we are. And let's start with one of a couple of the more famous passages in the Old Testament. There are others I don't have time to talk about, but Exodus 3, where God speaks to Moses from the burning bush and commands him to take off his sandals as he approaches. Moses wants to see what it is, and God says, take off your shoes because the ground you are standing on is holy ground. So in coming near to God's self-manifestation in this mysterious form, Moses has entered into a holy space, and it is holy because God is present. God is there, at least in some way. And so Moses can't approach God as one approaches a friend or a, a spouse or a coworker. Moses is to take off his sandals and in some way signifying that the ordinary dirt of life is left behind as he treads into the holy presence of God. When Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to encounter God, the people are kept away because the mountain is holy. So there are boundaries between what is holy and what is not. Everywhere that God is, is holy. Everywhere that God is, must be holy. God's temple is holy because it is where God dwells, the holy God dwells. The tabernacle and its courts are holy before the temple. Everything that serves in the holy places is to be holy. Everything that comes into the presence of the holy God must be holy. Priests, Levites, altars, animals, turbans, pots, you name it, they set apart for God and in some way they must be sanctified. Otherwise, if things that are not holy are brought into God's presence, then God's holiness is profaned. The need to be holy uh, is in the presence of the Lord is illustrated in what is surely one of the more memorable scenes about the holiness of God in Scripture, namely Isaiah's great vision in the temple. And I think we all know how this goes. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now Isaiah immediately goes on to lament his own unworthiness to stand before the one who was holy. And I said, writes Isaiah, says Isaiah, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah knows God to be other than he is, and the contrast between the God who is holy, and, and speaks of the contrast between the God who is holy and Isaiah who is unclean. Here is a marker, a boundary between holiness and that which is unclean. They are delineated from each other. In his book, The God We Worship, Nicholas Wolterstorff writes about this passage in Isaiah and others in the Bible that contrast unclean and holy and asks what this contrast reveals to us about God's holiness. He notes, of course, that the distinction between clean and unclean is really not one that resonates with many Western Christians, but it does run throughout scripture. Wolterstorff writes this, looking at the, uh, the story Isaiah and others. God's holiness is God's purity and perfection. God is in no way sullied, tainted, defiled, defective. God's holiness is God's transcendence, God's otherness, transcendence of all blemishes, of all stains and taints, of all defilements, of all perfections. To put it differently, holiness is not just one of the attributes of God, but that which differentiates God from everything else. As Hannah celebrates in her song of thanksgiving, there is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. So not only is holy one of the preferred descriptions of God in the Old Testament, but it is linked with God's uniqueness, God's singularity. There is no holy one like the Lord. No wonder, then, that when God's holiness comes into the picture, so does worship of God. The holiness of God evokes worship of God. So we have numbers of declarations from the Psalms that link holiness and worship, holiness and praise, and these are on your sheet as well. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. 
Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain is the joy of all the earth. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. And then as Isaiah writes, shout aloud and sing for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Now, in the church where I grew up, our choir often began the service, and maybe you know this brief refrain, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence, and it was always kind of sung, you know, you felt like you were supposed to just be really quiet. And I never, I wasn't quite sure I ever knew what it meant, but I knew it was supposed to provoke reverence. We were supposed to be meditating on something. It's very interesting to me that the scenes we've just looked at, no one's keeping silence, you know. They're singing and shouting and praising and extolling and seraphim and cherubim shouting out. It's exuberant worship of the holy God. Not only is holiness linked with worship, but the worship of the God who is alone is holy demands worship of God alone. The Israelites are commanded not to make any graven images or idols. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And these injunctions are often followed by the serious note, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There are boundaries to this relationship, and God is not interested in an open covenant, in sharing worship with any other God. The people are to worship God alone, for God alone is holy, alone worthy of reverence, alone worthy of worship. Remember what Jesus said at one of his temptations, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. These sentiments will later be summed up in the oracle in Revelation 15. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. Walter Storff again notes that in worship, the response of awe corresponds to the manifestations of God's glory, and reverence corresponds to God's holiness. And not only God's holiness, but God's unsurpassable holiness. Another way to think of it, I think, is to think of worship as a declaration of allegiance. Worship is a primary way, if not the primary way, in which ancient Israelites, Jews, and Christians declared their allegiance to the one God and to this God only. Let me just name a few examples from the many that we could uh, pull out. You will remember the story in Daniel 3. Three good men lived very long ago, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Um, They they were told, uh, it was reported to the king, they do not serve your gods and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. When they are finally delivered from their ordeal in the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar marveled that they had yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. The offense that the ca- of, of the captives was refusing to worship any god but their own, a declaration of allegiance through worship. Let's jump a number of years to the city, and you may remember the letter of Pliny, the governor of Bithynia, that he writes to the emperor Trajan. Uh, uh, Pliny has discovered some Christians and he wants to know what he's supposed to do with them. And he writes to Pliny the emperor and says, okay, um, I told them they had to participate in sacrifices to the gods, to offer incense to the emperor's image and to curse Christ. That's the right thing to do. And Pliny says, yeah, that's, that's the course to take. But you see, to coerce allegiance to the Roman empire, you had to coerce worship. So that's what Pliny's trying to do there on behalf of the Roman Empire. In the accounts of early martyrs, such as the martyrdom of Polycarp, the aged Polycarp could have been saved had he been willing to say that Caesar is Lord and to offer incense on Caesar's behalf. But Polycarp wouldn't do it. And some of you may know or remember his memorable and poignant response when they say, Polycarp, you're an old man. Just, Just do it and get it over with. And he says, I cannot denounce Christ. For 86 years, I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? It is in the martyrdom of Polycarp as well that Christians are accused of atheism, not believing in any gods, but the refusal to worship the gods of the Romans. 
a refusal to worship their gods is taken, then you see, as a denial of allegiance to the Roman emperor. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Hallowed be your name means at least worship this God and no other. Now, I want to look at a, a second uh, set of passages in Scripture that strike me as quite uh, apt to this, and this be, uh, is, is the ones that you find under the head, I will sanctify my great name. So God is holy and is to be worshipped as holy, but the worship of God can be defiled. For example, uh, and this is an extreme example, I know offering human sacrifice to Molech defiles and profanes the sanctuary of God, God's holy name. And this is an extreme case, but it is true that worship can be something, worship of other gods can defile God's name, while true worship sanctifies God's name. So worship can either defile or sanctify the name of God. There are other ways in which God's name is defiled or sanctified, made holy. So God commands Israel in Leviticus 22, keep my commandments and observe them so that you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord, I sanctify you. Just as worship of the holy God sanctifies God's name, so too keeping God's commandments keeps not God's name from being profaned. When God's people keep God's commands, God is sanctified among his people. In other words, it is by the way that God's people worship and the way that God's people live that God's name is sanctified among them. Now, we find a particularly, I think, uh, compelling statement of this in the book of Ezekiel, and I have a quote here on the sheet from that. The prophet describes the land as unclean and defiled by the worship of idols. The people, this is such a striking uh, quote to me, and let's just read it uh, from the beginning there. When, when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name in that it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. So it was known that the Lord sent his own people out of exile to there, and that profanes the holy name of God. The people had profaned God's holy name because it was known that God had sent them out of land. Their exile brings God into disrepute. It drags God's name through the mud. Even though it was this God who sent them into exile, what then is the remedy? How do you fix it? According to Ezekiel, what the people have defiled, God will sanctify. Here is the promise we read in Ezekiel 36, 23. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. How does this happen? It happens because God acts to sanctify, to hallow his own name. And that happens when God gathers the exiles from afar, brings them back to the land. God had sent them out, but now God will bring them back. But Ezekiel says more. Ezekiel promises, as you read on, that God will cleanse the people with clean water. God will give them a clean heart, a new spirit, so that they might obey God's statutes and ordinances. Now their actions will bring honor to God's name. Their obedience will keep God's name from being profaned. So together, God's act of delivering and sanctifying his name and the people's response of obedience sanctify the name of God. So following the train of thought in Ezekiel, when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are calling upon God to act, to do something to gather his people together, to manifest his salvation precisely in order to sanctify his own holy name. And when God sanctifies his name, God's people are not left out of the picture. Even as the Israelites had defiled God's holy name through their idolatry and disobedience, their proper reverence and obedience sanctifies God's name. So that's a very quick overview, but let's think now about the Gospels in light of uh, that uh, quick look at some passages in the Old Testament. Curiously, to me at least, the description of God as holy does not feature very prominently in the Gospels, especially when compared to the Old Testament. It's almost the exact reverse of the situation with God as Father. You can find Father in the Old Testament a little bit, a lot in the Gospels, 
holiness a lot in the Old Testament, a little bit in the Gospels. But like his contemporaries, I think Jesus believed that the temple was to be kept as the holy house of God, and he demonstrates that as he uh, drives the money changers out of the temple. His prophetic warnings of the temple's destruction reflect the belief that as the house of God, the temple ought to be a holy place and that God would pass judgment on it, even as Jeremiah reports would happen for failure to uh, keep the temple, the proper temple of the Lord. Jesus said one was not to swear an oath by heaven or by Jeru earth or by Jerusalem, since these are represented as the throne, the footstool, and the city of the king. In other words, they are gods. And as gods, they are holy. To use what is holy as the validation of an oath is to defile it. Now, when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, hallowed be thy name, he's not innovating. He's echoing, I think, a prayer that is known as the Kaddish, the holy, the a prayer of sanctification, a Jewish prayer that opens with these words, exalted and hallowed be his great name in the earth which he has created. God's name is holy. It is to be honored and praised. Now, it is to be uh, kept and honored as holy. Now, there's a bit of a paradox there, I think, as Kenneth Bailey points out when he says, to pray to God that his name be made holy is a bit like saying, may the wood become solid, or may the fire become hot. The wood is already solid, and the fire is already hot. God's name is the most holy reality there is. Everything else may be unclean, but the name of God is holy. So in the first century, there were some very practical ways which you may know the holy name of God was honored and protected. As many of you know, when God's name is given in the Old Testament, uh, the four Hebrew consonants, which we call the tetragrammaton, the four letters, uh, the, the letters are written, but they are not, and the name is thought, at least one of the pronunciations that we think might have been used is Yahweh, but we don't say that when we read the Old Testament. When you're reading the Old Testament in Hebrew, you can say Adonai, and that's why your English translations render that as the Lord, because they're not translating the name, but they are translating what is read, Adonai. In fact, sometimes when you read text, you just say Hashem, which means the name. Okay, so that rather than say the name of God, uh, readers of scripture, pious readers of scripture, Jews to this day won't say it. Some will not even write it. You will have seen G dash D, that it is just, it's a, a way of reverence. And if I had time, I would show you some slides of uh, text from the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on, where not only do they not speak the name, they don't write even the Hebrew letters. They put dots or they write in uh, uh, Paleo Hebrew or something. It's just a way of saying, think about this. This is the holy name of God. No one goes around saying, OMG, <laughs> just tossing it off. It's the holy name of God. You don't speak it. Why not? Well, the name stands for the person of God, doesn't it? To bless the name of God is to bless God. To hallow the name of God is to honor the God who is holy. Remember in his last prayer in the Gospel of John, Jesus says he has made God's name known. Well, what he does is to make God known. Now, a little bit about this petition about God's holiness. I've mentioned boundaries a couple of times, and there are boundaries between things that are holy and things that are common. Not everyone enters into the Holy of Holies, but only the high priest. Not all clothing is holy, but clothing and accessories worn by the high priest are to be holy. So in this schema, what makes something holy, as I've said before, is that it is set apart for God. And the opposite would be, the opposite of holy would be common or ordinary. So here's my little pot, okay? This is a common pot. There is nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's just ordinary. We have these all over our houses, right? I could make it holy and set it apart for service for God through certain you know, prayers and rituals and so on. It could be made holy, and then it becomes a different thing. And to stay holy, it has, you have to keep it holy, like the name of God. But it's, just, it's important for us to see that if it hasn't set, been set aside for holy use, it's not sanctified, but it's not evil. It's just ordinary. We have ordinary time on the Christian calendar, right? It's just common, ordinary time. It's good. So I'll come back to my pot. Okay, so now you've got just a common, ordinary pot. It's not holy, but it's good. All right. When we talk about, well, let me, let me uh, talk about this, and then I'll get 
back to my pot. Things can be set aside for God and made holy. Places like the temple are sanctified. Time, like the Sabbath, can be set apart for God. God's people are holy because they are set apart for God. And you get this refrain in scripture, you shall be holy for I am holy. And at least some of the time that is followed by, well, it's always followed by, they are not to worship idols and they are not to eat what is unclean, clean or unclean. So here comes the talk about clean and unclean food. And here we come into a very complex realm of what is known as purity laws uh, or things that relate to purity. And holiness is inseparable, I think, in scripture from purity and from purity laws that govern Israel's life and which separate clean and unclean things. Now, holiness and purity are not identical, but they are related. So because God is holy, Israel is to make a distinction between clean and unclean foods and not to eat anything that is unclean. So there are boundaries between foods, things that, is, that the Israelites cannot eat. There is another complicated set of laws that govern what we sometimes call contact impurity. And this actually plays, I think, a very large role in uh, the Gospels, at least in the Synoptic Gospels. This kind of impurity or uncleanness is treated extensively in the Old Testament and then in later Jewish literature. Contact impurity is just what it sounds like. You can become impure through contact. It's contagious. Impurity can be transferred or spread by touching a person or a thing that is also impure. So you may know this, corpses are unclean. Therefore, to touch a corpse, you become unclean. You don't become evil. You just become ritually impure. Bodily fluids or discharges, men and women alike, can render them unclean for a period of time. One of the things you see in the Gospels is those with skin diseases. This is typically translated leprosy, but that is probably not what that disease is. It's a very, uh, variety of skin diseases. Th those diseases render a person unclean. So contact with any of these things or person renders the person who touched them unclean, not sinful, but unclean, ritually impure. So here's my little pot. So it's ordinary, and at this stage it is clean. But if it is contacted or touched or unclean liquid is poured into it, it will become unclean. Now supposing we want to take this pot, this, you got to imagine that this is the way this is working, okay? There's a lot of rules about how clean and unclean work, and technically stone jars are resistant to impurity, but we're going to say this is a clay jar, so it's very porous, so it's, it's going to become unclean. Okay, so now I have my impure pot, and I want to make it holy. But what is impure can never enter into the realm of holiness, okay? What is clean can, can become holy, and it, what is clean can become impure, but that which is impure cannot enter into the realm of holiness, okay? So that a vessel, it's not that difficult to make it clean. I mean, it can happen, right? Um, usually something is made pure or clean through the passage of time, through washing with water, and depending on what the impurity is, through sacrifice or something else. But you, you see the difference. Here's holy, here's ordinary, here's, here's impure, here's, or unclean, here's clean. And there can be varieties of them, but what you cannot have is unclean in the realm of the holy. I know you don't believe me on this, but trust me, we'll come back to it. Now, what complicates matters a bit is that the Old Testament uses the language of clean and unclean, or pure and impure, to speak both of ritual and moral purity. When Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean nips, lips, he does not mean he has drunk from an unclean vessel. He does not mean that he has contracted ritual impurity. When the seraphim touches Isaiah's lips with the burning coal, he says, your guilt is taken away, your sin is forgiven. That burning ember does not remove ritual impurity, but moral impurity or moral defilement. Why does any of this matter? I'm sure most contemporary Christians think matters of impurity, matters of ritual impurity, of how one contracts impurity, or how one may avoid it, are all part of what we as Christians have left behind. We might understand moral impurity, like Isaiah talks about, but ritual impurity often seems to us to be the height of triviality. It leads to legalism. 
right? It, I've used the word boundaries multiple times. Purity suggests boundaries, and boundaries separate things. Boundaries exclude. Surely Jesus did not like boundaries, and he did not like exclusion. Surely Jesus was inclusive and must have rejected all boundaries and disavowed all boundary markers. He must have erased the boundary marker between clean and unclean, between what is holy and what is holy. To use an image, if you have Mount Sinai as holy, Jesus just flattens the landscape and everything. The, the boundaries are gone. So I want to suggest a different way of looking at these boundaries between pure and unpure, holy and common. And I'm going to do this by borrowing a quotation from an article by Marcus Bachmuhl, who is a professor at Oxford University. And the short title of the piece is Keeping It Holy, but it's in a volume of collected essays on the Ten Commandments, I think. I don't remember the whole name. And this is what he says, and I want to read it to you because I don't think I put it on the handout. But when I read it, it just struck me as a powerful way to think of things. The call of the people of God, the call of the people of God is to participate in God's exclusively one-way mission. So get that image, God's exclusively one-way mission to push the boundaries of holiness further and further into the realm of the profane and to eliminate pollution in order to expand the realm of purity. Now, in the Gospels, Jesus does not seek to preserve God's holiness by building barriers between God's holy name and any potential sources of contamination. God does not keep his distance from things that are holy or impure. Rather, in the Gospels, God's holiness is a power that flowed through Jesus into the world. And we see Jesus both removing impurity and sanctifying people, times, and places. God's mission pushes into the world to remove impurity thus expanding the realm of purity, God's mission pushes the boundaries of his holiness, his transforming power ever further into the world. Now, to look at this a bit, I want to do a reading with you of the Gospel of Mark and ask just how that works out in the Gospel of Mark. So I'm not going to do every passage in Mark, but I just want to pick some vignettes, you know, the ones that prove my point. So the rest you can ask about later. So According to Mark, Jesus goes out to be baptized by John, and when he does, the heavens are torn apart. Now, many English translations render this Greek phrase, the heavens were opened, a rather tame description. But the word means torn or divided. It's not simply opened. You don't tear open a door, you open a door. It's the same word one finds in the prayer in Isaiah 64.1, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. And this is just what happens. The heavens are torn open. The spirit comes down like a dove. Perhaps because the spirit is portrayed as a dove and not tongues of fire as an ax. If you look at uh, artistic renderings of this, the classical paintings over the ages, everyone's just standing very still. Um, and the father is sometimes, you know, pouring the dove out and the dove is gently coming down. But... There's almost no emotion. There's no sense that this spirit is a spirit of power. It's, it's, they're, they're lovely paintings. I wish I'd brought some to show you, but you've probably all seen them. Um, the, heaven just, the dove just comes and lands gently on Jesus' shoulder. But what if this whole scene should be viewed as more dynamic, more powerful, more mysterious? The heavens, when, which in this cosmology separate God from the world, are torn apart and through that torn open heavens, God's Holy Spirit, the power of God's holiness, the power that makes Moses tremble, the power that makes Isaiah quake, that power comes down on Jesus. Now imbued with the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus engages in his mission in the world. Karl Barth talks about this spirit, this scene as the spirit piercing like an underwater volcano pushes through the surface of a calm sea. You know, just Boom, that power of that volcano. Now, many know that Jesus was an exorcist, driving out demons. But it is important to note that in the Gospel of Mark, the spirits are called unclean, akathartos. So when Jesus entered the synagogue of Capernaum and encountered a man with an unclean spirit, he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, thus rendering the man clean. You may remember other, in other accounts of exorcisms, Jesus silences the demons because they know who he is. We know who you are, the Holy One of God, 
It's like Isaiah, who is unclean, recognizes his uncleanness in the face of the holy God. They recognize and honor the power of God's holiness in Jesus. A man with a skin disease comes to Jesus, and in one of the most poignant requests in the gospel says, Jesus, if you choose, you can make me clean. Now, note what Jesus does not say. He does not say, you know, impurity is really irrelevant here. Um, I think of you as clean. You should think of yourself as clean. You don't need cleansing. Impurity laws are out of date. No, he says, instead, if, when the man says, if you choose, you can make me clean, Jesus says, I do choose. Be made clean. Mark notes immediately the disease left him and he was made clean. You may remember the 10 lepers in uh, 10 people with skin disease in Luke 17. Um, Jesus does something, says something, then says, go show yourself to the priest. Carry out now these rituals so that you can see, he can see, the priest can see, you're clean. By the power of the Holy Spirit upon him, Jesus has the power to drive out an unclean spirit. Jesus brings God's outgoing, transforming power of holiness to bear in the lives of his people. Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners. He didn't fear contamination from eating at table with sinners or tax collectors or anyone who had not scrupulously kept purity laws and so might be unclean, any who were sinners and so might somehow implicate him in their sin. Rather than fearing the impurity, you know, that could flow from outside in, Jesus seemed to regard the power of God's holiness as flowing from him out, the sanctifying, cleansing power. And so he casts out demons, he forgives sins, he eats at table with sinners. A later chapter in Mark contains two accounts of Jesus making the unclean clean. The Gerizim demoniac is described as a man with an unclean spirit, and to make it worse, he lives among the tombs. You may know that tombs are, uh, can, can pass on uncleanness as well. That's why they're whitewashed, so you can see them and avoid them. So that to be in, a, in, in the tombs is to be in an unclean world, unclean state. Um, contact with him or the corpses would render a person unclean. His plight is real. The story describes him in social isolation, mental anguish. He's inflicting harm on himself. Jesus exercises his power, his holy power, the power of the Holy Spirit in the service of driving out impurity and restoring the man to human society and wholeness. That story is followed by the story of the narrative of a woman with a flow of blood. A flow of blood renders a woman unclean, whether it's monthly, and in this case, the woman has had it for 12 years. Now, we don't know if that means every minute of the day, but it's, she can't fix it. I think Luke says she'd been to a lot of doctors and they were no help. <laughs> Luke, the beloved physician. Um, the woman is desperate. And believing that Jesus could heal her, she presses her way forward in the crowd. I just want to touch the cloak, his cloak, the hem of his garment. And immediately she is healed. And what Mark writes is so interesting. Jesus sensed that power had gone out from him. The same way this power has been flowing through him into the world. The story pictures healing power. Merciful, holy power is flowing out from him rather than defiling or contagious pow uh, powers, forces flowing in. But Mark has more to say about impurity and purity, and specifically about what constitutes true purity. At one point, Jesus is asked, why do you eat with unwashed or unclean hands? Because your washed, unwashed or unclean hands could defile this pot or this food you're touching. Why haven't you washed your hands? We could talk later about this. This is a Pharisaic innovation, but be that as it may, the worry is defilement. Um, and eating defiled food. This is a question about contact impurity, I believe. Jesus responds with a brief lesson on what truly defiles. And here, like the prophets of old, Jesus does put far greater emphasis on moral purity than he does on ritual purity. And this is what Jesus says. You want to know what really defiles? It's what comes out of a person. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. 
And when people are defiled by their actions, then the holy name of God is defiled too. Elsewhere, Jesus put it this way, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person brings good things out of a good treasure, and the evil person brings evil things out of an evil treasure. And here are the most terrifying words Jesus ever spoke. I tell you on the day of judgment, you will have to give an account for every careless word you utter. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I'm sure Jesus didn't really say that, right? He didn't really, didn't really mean it. Impurity can be dealt with by ritual washing and the passage of time. If my little jug becomes unclean, I can wash it in the passage of time. Impurity can be removed, impurity like that. That's not the kind of impurity that should trouble you, Jesus says. The kind of impurity that ought to trouble you is the kind that made Isaiah cry out, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I think this is the kind of impurity that we have in the story of Simon uh, in Luke 5, where Simon Peter, is, uh, after the, the amazing catch of fish, falls down in the boat at the feet of Jesus and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He has recognized some holy power at work here, and all he can say is, I I'm a sinner. It's very much like Isaiah. The theologian Helmut Thielicke once said this, the truth is, we cannot pray the Lord's Prayer to the glory of God unless at the same time we pray it against ourselves. For there are certain areas of our life which are stubbornly resolved, which we are stubbornly resolved to keep for ourselves, and which we refuse to surrender to God. Areas of which we know perfectly well that God could never sign his name to them, and which we therefore hide away in the bottommost pigeonhole of our life. Telica's imagery is provocative. He asks, could God sign his name, his holy name, to our lives? We could ask that differently. Would our lives hallow God's name? It seems to me in regards to this, Heidelberg Catechism question 122 pretty much nails it. What does the first petition mean? Question. Answer. How would be your name means help us to truly know you, to honor, glorify, and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from them, your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. And it means help us to direct all our living, what we think, say, and do, so that your name will never be blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, hallowed be thy name, he is calling on God to sanctify his people by transforming their hearts so that they are obedient to the will of God, to make the tree good. Jesus pushes the boundaries of God's sanctifying presence and power further and further into the world. The gospel stories show that as in the Old Testament, impurity must be removed in order to participate in holiness. But the gospels also show that God's mission is not to erect barriers, not to throw up boundaries, not to keep people at arm's length, not to avoid contamination, but to come with the transforming Holy Spirit into the world among his people, even those who have defiled his name so as to sanctify them for himself. This is what Jimmy Dunn once called the outgoing power of divine holiness. The petition, Hallowed Be Your Name, asks God to do something to bring honor to his name because only the holy God can make his own name holy. Now, holiness, I think, can sound rather dark and foreboding, maybe sort of static or boring. But participating in the mission of the holy God brought Jesus joy. When the disciples report, even the demons are subject to us in your name, Jesus, it is said, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. The parables of the things that are lost, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, told to silence the grumbling of those who said, Jesus, you eat with tax collectors and sinners, those who are likely impure, non-observant. But when those lost are found, there is joy and celebration in heaven. The God who compels Jesus on mission is the God who celebrates the finding and restoration of the lost. 
After the resurrection, the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, continues the mission of Jesus to push the boundaries of holiness ever further into the world. God's people are now sent into the, all the world, to all the nations, to the Gentiles, who are now brought into the holy people of God. So Paul greets them, Romans, Corinthians, others, as saints, holy ones. They are made holy, sanctified in Christ. They share in one Holy Spirit. They grow into a holy temple in the Lord. They are a dwelling place for the holy God. They are a holy nation, a royal people, God's own people. They participate in exclusive worship now of the one God. They invite others to participate and share in that same worship. They endeavor to live and they call for an undivided allegiance to God that transcends and surpasses all other loyalties, including those to any emperor, state, king, or God. God's people are set apart first and fo foremost for God, whose ways and will are not coterminous with any human kingdom or construct. And together these people anticipate the holy city, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. We are told nothing unclean enters the city. It is full of light, of healing for the nations. I love that line that the trees in the city are for the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Holiness and healing go together. Now there is no temple anymore, for the dwelling of God is among mortals. God and the Lamb together live among their people, and they dwell with God, and they worship God and the Lamb. And whereas Isaiah with unclean lips lamented that he had seen the Holy One, woe is me, for I am unclean, and I have seen the Holy, One, uh, the Holy God. Now, in the holy city that comes down, the holy people will see God's face. And God's holy name will be on their foreheads. And they will know God, the one transcendent, untainted, pure, and holy God, who is their light, and with God they reign forever and ever. Hallowed be thy name. Thank you. Well, I heard at least one amen. I think there were others that could have been said. Thank you so much. And I'm grateful that we have a guest from next door, Dr. David Young. He's on the faculty of Hope College. Uh, his area of specialty is the Hebrew Bible Old Testament and in its interpretation in ancient Judaism and early Christianity. Um, he's working on some book projects, including one on the influence of Deuteronomy's concept of the prophet like Moses in the history of Israelite prophecy. Thank you for being with us, and we look forward to your response. And then we'll follow with, Q with a response from Dr. Thompson, and then Q&A. So please be thinking of what you might want to ask. Good evening. It's an, uh, thank you, Kristen, for that introduction. Um, thank you, Suzanne and Todd, for the kind invitation to take part in this enriching event, and uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson, for that wonderful lecture. I'm looking forward to our discussion. There are three topics for the lectures, God as Father, God's Holiness, and God's Kingdom. Which of these topics sounds the most Old Testament-like <laughs> to you? God as Father, the Kingdom of God, these are classic New Testament topics, but holiness? In fact, Professor Thompson's wonderful lectures on all these themes, uh, and I've had a preview of all of them, will demonstrate the deep interconnectedness of the two Testament canon. Father and kingdom are Old Testament categories as well, and holiness is a major concern of the new. Indeed, I would argue that, although I'm not going to make this argument this evening, contrary to what we might assume, the emphasis on holiness is increased in the New Testament relative to the old. So... I hope it won't be disappointing to you that I have very few objections to Dr. Thompson's wonderful lecture. There will be no academic fight this evening. They're, they're rather unseemly, so it's probably for the best. I, I, I did say very few objections, so I may come back to a quibble or two later on. Most of what I want to do is by way of interpretation and extension of her remarks. Knowing that I was giving these remarks at a Reformed seminary, my response uh, almost automatically organize itself into three points. Um, and I also tried to make them alliterative, although the attempt was a bit weak. You'll have to give me points for trying. 
Holiness is about boundaries, holiness burns, and holiness is debated. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's weak, I admit it. <laughs> Professor Thompson rightly emphasizes that holiness is about boundaries. And fundamentally, fundamentally, it is about the ultimate boundary between creator and creature. She rightly begins her lecture by focusing on holiness and the worship of the one true God. The first petition of the Lord's Prayer is deeply connected to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Indeed, in its Matthean context, the Lord's Prayer is presented as the prayer as of the one who would radically fulfill the Torah from the heart. Holiness is not only about boundaries, it is about this ultimate boundary. It is about ultimate allegiances. Even the coming of the king, and that's why it's the first petition, just as that's why the first commandment is the first commandment, even the coming of the kingdom is not an ultimate but a penultimate good. You can see 1 Corinthians 15 for that. I was recently reading Rabbi Abram Joshua Heschel's little book on Sabbath, and he says the following, quote, to the philosopher the idea of the good is the most exalted idea, but to the Bible the idea of the good is penultimate. It cannot exist without the holy. The good is the base the holy is the summit. Things created in six days he considered good. The seventh day he made holy. Holiness then is about the ultimate boundary and has to do with one's ultimate allegiance. In relation to this theme, Professor Thompson interestingly highlights a series of texts from Daniel 3 to the martyrdom of Polycarp in which Jews and Christians express their conviction that God's name alone is to be hallowed by risking even their lives for this conviction. There is no simple way to transfer this political aspect of the first petition to our modern context, but it is important to remember this imperial context in which the prayer of one who prayed, hallowed be thy name, would be the prayer of one who was ready, in the words of Jesus, to take up their cross and follow him. The hallowing of God's name is not only to be humanity's ultimate allegiance, but it is God's. Um, and this is uh, something striking in the Old Testament. Uh, there are penultimate and proximate reasons for which God acts, and there are ultimate reasons for which God acts. Uh, this is foundationally established in the Exodus narrative. The proximate reasons for which God acts in the Exodus narrative are uh, he hears the cries of his people. He remembers his covenant. Uh, and he said, aren't those the fundamental reasons? Aren't those the foundational reasons why God acts? Actually, God acts in the Exodus narrative to make his name known. And this is the ultimate reason that his name, he says, I raised you up, Pharaoh, for this very purpose, that my name would be uh, acknowledged uh, by you and known among the nations. And this is what Ezekiel is picking up on in Ezekiel 36, uh, which Professor Dr. Thompson quotes. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus is the Lord, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. Why does God say God is not acting on behalf of God's people? Doesn't God do so? The key here is to see that holiness is about ultimacy, the ultimate boundary, the ultimate allegiance. And even for God, God's ultimate allegiance is to God's name. This focus on holiness in Ezekiel 36 perhaps casts new light on the following passage, the famous account of the dry bones. To a priest like Ezekiel, this vision is not only one of divine omnipotence conquering human impossibility, but also of divine holiness overwhelming human impurity. So holiness is about boundaries, but Ezekiel catches a vision in which God will act to extend the boundaries of holiness by recreating a holy people. Um, and so that's the first point, holiness about boundaries. Second point, holiness burns. Here I'm thinking of John the Baptist's words about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Uh, not actually a pleasant experience. I've always understood these words to refer to events that happen subsequent to the narrative of the Gospels, not on the page of the Gospels themselves. Dr. Thompson's lecture has caused me to reconsider. Isn't it the case that the radical holiness extending from Jesus and eradicating impurities functions as a proleptic baptism in a fiery spirit, one that will be more fully realized at Pentecost? Uh, 
as noted by Dr. Thompson, many Christians would prefer to have a Christian who uh, prefer to have a Jesus who does not burn away impurities, who in fact is not particularly concerned about holiness at all. In this ahistorical reconstruction, Jesus' Pharisaic opponents are all about boundaries and law, and Jesus comes as a freewheeling, anything goes partier, opposed to all rules and regulations. This is a way of creating a Jesus that conforms to modern sensibilities. It elides a real encounter with Jesus, the first century Jewish prophet and teacher. I want to express, as an Old Testament scholar, I want to express my appreciation for the way Dr. Thompson has presented to Jesus who would read and affirm Leviticus 1 to 16, which as she noted, many Christians find trivial and irrelevant. In an important, important recent book on this theme, Matthew Thiessen's Jesus and the Forces of Death, uh, Matthew Thiessen has shown how often New Testament scholars have portrayed Jesus as opposing the ritual purity system in Leviticus, when in fact what the gospel writers are doing is portraying Jesus as opposing and eradicating ritual impurities themselves, not the ritual impurity system uh, that was in place. And, which, uh, and these impurities are, in Thiessen's Th shorthand, the forces of death. Uh, Jesus is opposing the forces of death, not the incomplete and partial system that was there to, to manage these forces of death. Dr. Thompson calls attention to the verb schizo in Mark 1. The heavens are torn. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus so that his body and even his garments become a sight radiating the power of holiness. As a tangent, I sort of wonder if the focus on Jesus' garments in some of these stories is, is related to the sense of the boundary between the holy and the impure. Like the heavens, Jesus' garments conceal the divine power of holiness, but also serve as a site of potential transfer of holy power. The unclean spirits rightly worry about the destructive potential of this power. Have you come to destroy us, is a common refrain. I do wonder what Dr. Thompson thinks about the other use of the verb schizo to divide in Mark, surely related to this theme. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Exapneusen, he breathed his last. This use of exapneusen, spirit coming out, and the use of schizo surely relates back to Mark 1 verse 10, but what is the significance of this moment? It is often thought that it is related to Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple, and it's a sign of the end of the physical order, and, and that's a very popular interpretation. To me, it seems that the sign is a little more specific than that. Something is going on about holiness here. It is typically thought that the force tearing the veil is coming from within the Holy of Holies. But I am attracted to a minority viewpoint, and I, I admit it's somewhat speculative, so I'm, I'm be very interested to hear pushback on this, but it's argued for by Craig Evans, among others, which is that it, the force that tears the veil is coming from outside, from Jesus, and, and tears it fr from without. He breathes out the spirit, and the veil tears. He breathes his last, exopenusin. What is not often emphasized enough here uh, is that Jesus' body has become a corpse, that is a site of ritual impurity. To think with the Old Testament is to realize that such contact between holiness and impurity is surely going to produce some powerful detonation of sorts. At the very moment when Jesus' body becomes a corpse, the force of holiness tears the temple curtain and returns to the heavens. Thus, for Mark, at least in my view, this event is not about God becoming accessible to humanity in a new way, some of the uh, common interpretations you hear, but the power of divine holiness becoming temporarily inaccessible. By rejecting and killing the Messiah, we have rendered access to the holiness we need inaccessible. The Spirit has left, torn the veil gone back to the heavens. But God will act to sanctify God's name. God will raise Jesus to an indestructible life, so the power of holiness will become available and accessible in a more permanent way by the outpouring of his spirit. And I admit this is a somewhat speculative interpretation, so I would love to hear what Dr. Thompson thinks about this text. My third point, uh, my weak alliterative point, holiness is debated. In terms of method, Dr. Thompson provided a very powerful synthesis focusing on the unified scriptural teaching about holiness. But there can be more granular readings of the scriptural witness that attend not to its overall unified witness, but to disagreement and debate in these texts about what it might mean to be a people that sanctifies God's name. 
I'll provide three quick examples, one from the Old Testament, one from the New, and one, and here I'm really stepping out of my specialty, but one from church history. Uh, one, after the return from exile, Ezra, the priest, focused on the fact that holiness requires separation. For him, holiness required divorce, as the priest had intermarried with the peoples of the land. Ezra 9, verse 2, the holy seed has mixed itself with the peoples of the land, and Ezra undertakes a harsh uh, reform action to understand this action charitably, to give him the benefit of the doubt, as it were, is to see that he's committed to the principle of holiness, uh, which required that Israel was a distinct kingdom of priests. His worry was that this distinct identity would be completely blurred and forgotten if Israel integrated with the peoples of the land. And yet we have other texts written, such as the book of Esther, where a Jewish girl hides her identity, intermarries with a foreign king, does not keep laws of clean and unclean foods, and yet becomes the means for the salvation of her people. And we have the admittedly cryptic and much contested oracle in Malachi, which specifies, it appears, seems to specify that God hates divorce, if that indeed is the right reading of the text. So what does holiness require? Does it require divorce, as in the case of Ezra, or is divorce a departure from holiness, as in the case of Malachi and later the teaching of Jesus? A second point is one that Dr. Thompson discussed, Jesus' relationship with the law of clean and unclean foods. Now, Mark famously interprets Jesus' opposition to ritual hand-washing as a declaration that all foods were clean. Um, it seems Jesus made no such direct pronouncement on laws of clean and unclean foods, and Mark this is clearly an editorial comment. Indeed, the gospel writer's general reticence to intervene in their narratives suggests this is a matter of some importance to Mark. I think Mark is sort of the kid in the classroom who's really eager. Like, this is what this means, right? He thus declared all foods clean, right? Um, Matthew, his fellow student sitting behind him in the classroom, does not think that this is what this means, right? Um, he's not so sure. After all, the direct focus of the controversy is not the food laws themselves, but the Pharisaic tradition of washing one's hands before eating seems like a good tradition, I might add. In the parallel passage, in Matthew 15, we see not only that the Markan editorial comment, he thus declared all foods clean, has been excised, but also that Jesus' statement of what defiles has been softened. In Mark, Jesus says that what comes outside is not able to defile a person, is not possible. There's nothing... Quote, there's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, dunatai, but the things that come out are what defile. For Matthew, this was too strong. Even if the primary source of defilement is from within, it is still the case that one can be made unclean by external things. Matthew says, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. For Mark, Jesus' pronouncements on what defiles were a proleptic declaration that keeping the laws of clean and unclean foods was no longer an essential part of holiness. For Matthew, to move ahead to Matthew 23, it is important to keep the weightier matters of justice and mercy without neglecting the less important ritual external observances. This is perhaps a difference of emphasis more than outright contradiction, but it illustrates that for the earliest followers of Jesus, holiness and what it means to hallow God's name uh, was debated. A third example comes from the history of the church. I'm, I'm really kind of stepping out of my expertise here, but um, as an Old Testament scholar, I... I I read the full text of uh, Dr. Thompson's lecture, and my heart was strangely warmed by her attention to detail in Old Testament law, which, which she did summarize a little bit uh, in her comments for you this evening, talking about how books and vessels and pots and utensils were all required to be holy. And, you know, as she noted, holiness can accrue to uh, people, like persons, like the high priest, places, like the sanctuary, objects, like the Ark of the Covenant, and time, uh, people, places, objects, and time. Uh, when we consider Christian history, uh, we notice that our Roman Catholic siblings have maintained a greater emphasis on holiness in all four of these spheres. Uh, the people, the priests have, have a tradition of celibacy as marking themselves as holy and dedicated to God. Uh, places are holy, uh, whether that be shrines or the approach to church architecture and one's attitude in holy places. There are holy objects, such as relics and icons that are used in worship. There are many, many holy days. Uh, so these debates about holiness have, I think, dramatically impacted Christian piety and the shape it takes across the centuries in different traditions. On the one hand, uh, 
the reformers rightly insisted on the goodness of the created order and God's presence with us in our ordinary lives, right? Uh, the realm of the holy was pushed back to recover and insist on the importance of the realm of the good, right? Uh, but my question then is whether the danger for Protestants is not in eclipsing the realm of the holy altogether and whether we have something to learn uh, from our Roman Catholic siblings here, um, what room is left for the holy. So debates about holiness and what it requires have, have never really ceased. They're still going on. I don't think the fact that it's debated should lead Christians to abandon their principles or to assert that anything goes after all. There, there may be debates about the boundaries of holiness, and it doesn't mean those boundaries uh, do not exist, even if we can't know precisely what they are. Um, I also think that we can look at these debates about what it means to be a holy people as a gift to the church. Our sacred writings, even our founding documents, contain the stories of real people struggling, arguing, debating about what it means to hallow God's name. Uh, and that's a gift. That in itself is a gift to us who are still struggling and arguing and debating about what it means to hallow God's name. Uh, it has ever been thus, and God has never given up on us. Ultimately, these are my concluding remarks, God is the one who ensures that God's name is sanctified. In our faltering efforts, we may be pale reflections of the burning power of holiness, sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker. But God's holiness is likened to the sun, which uh, serves as an inexhaustible source of the radiating power of holiness in our lives. Sanctification is a process that burns, and for the church and for individuals, it may be two steps forward, one step back. Augustine's prayer is ever on our hearts, command what you will, grant what you command. But God's goal is to sanctify a people who will see him forever. Uh, holiness blinds, holiness burns, but as Dr. Thompson rightly concludes, the process of becoming holy will lead to that clear and direct vision of God. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that wonderful response. There's really, I, I wish we had time to sit down and talk more, but let me comment on two or three things um, because there are questions you raised. I won't co comment on everything that was so good. Schizo, the heavens were torn open. Yes, the, uh, the next place in Mark that you see it is the temple curtain is torn. And I think under the influence of Hebrews, people have often read that as, and therefore now the Holy of Holies becomes accessible. So. I have to think about this other interpretation. It's interesting, but the one I am kind of attracted to is just as the heavens are open so that the power of holiness comes down into the world, the temple curtain is torn open and the power of God's holiness is now out in the world. See, it's, it's the same, same movement, something that has been protected, torn open, and the power comes out this way. Um, There are a few places in which the King James Bible got something right. <laughs> One of those is Mark 7.19, talking about clean and unclean foods. And I don't have the King James with me, but it reads something like this. You know, it isn't what, go, defi what, it's not what goes into a person from outside that defiles, since it enters not his heart but his stomach, and so passes on, thus cleansing all foods. I don't know why the RSV and all subsequent translations have gone with a statement that Jesus declared all foods clean. And that's because the, you really want to know this, the participle, it's not a finite verb, he declared all foods clean. The verb declare is not in there. What is in there is just a participle cleansing all foods. And I agree with you that Mark is stronger than this, on this than Matthew. Um, or Matthew backs off a little bit more, but in none of the Gospels does Jesus declare foods clean. You never see Jesus eating at table with a Gentile or entering into the house of a Gentile, and Peter's news to him that Jesus had told him to eat clean foods. Now, we know Peter is unusually slow, but it seems to me very odd that you would get to Acts and Peter would say, what? <laughs> you know, he says, I've never eaten anything unclean. I suspect that's true, and I suspect that's true of Jesus as well. So my problem with, I, but that does not take away from your point that holiness is debatable. I, I agree there. 
And you could even see that if you start looking at the purity systems of Second Temple Judaism, which can, you know, the Sadducees do it one way and the Pharisees do it and the Dead Sea schools. How do you, which, wa which liquid contaminates what, you, you know, the questions about divorce and other kinds of things. So I, I do agree with that. It's, uh, it's debated. And thank you for making the point that it doesn't take away, nevertheless, from the importance of keeping holiness as a as a uh, boundary. But yeah, absolutely, the question even within the, the New Testament. Um, and then your last point was one, um, oh, the syn this, the, I have done some synthesis. Yeah, and if I had more, and whereas uh, the, 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 you might say the biblical picture is a bit less, less neat, messier, uh, and, and I suppose what I have done, and if I had, and even here it, it's tricky, I realize, I think Jesus picks and chooses. I think the Gospels pick and choose. So they may ignore one law or one verse here and, and they construct a view or Jesus constructs and we could play with who that is. That doesn't always take all the Old Testament texts into account. And so one of the interesting things is to ask, how does Jesus read the Old Testament? Which parts does he read? You know, um, it's almost always the prophets, as you know, Isaiah. Um, Deuteronomy and the Psalms are the three books that get cited most in the New Testament. Why is that? Why aren't people citing Judges, and, you know, Second Kings or whatever it might be? So I think we could talk at length there about it. who's doing the synthesizing and I'm sort of then once I've done it I'm look, looking back and acting as though the Bible going forward is much more synthetic than it is but it's because I'm assuming you know, in a sense that this is what Jesus is doing and trying to get it, try, reading backwards, but it, it is looking like I'm reading forwards. So that's a, that's a helpful corrective, I think. Or a few questions. Here we go. Thanks for kicking us off. That was just, that was just a finger. I didn't oh. I call on me, <laughs> but I did have a question. It was, um, I, I don't get something and it bugs me. It, and it bugs me about um, Matt Thiessen's book, too. Um, so I'm glad his book was brought in by David. Um, I mean, Thiessen says he's just explicating Mark through most of the book. But then, like most Duke New Testament scholars, he goes back on it the last few pages. Uh, There's at least two of us in the room, so you have to be I know, <laughs> I'm perfectly aware of that. Yeah, I'm... Um, I, what I don't get is um, if Mark is portraying Jesus' holiness as, as, as repelling death uh, under the guise of ritual impurity, as with the women's menstrual flow yeah. or contamination by viewing in a funeral parlor, even in the same room, uh, I can see that could be how Mark is representing what Jesus' holiness is doing, but I don't get how we're supposed to apply that. Do we think there is such a thing as ritual uncleanness, or that there was, and that Jesus' holiness repels it? If so, how does ritual uncleanness apply to us? Are we going to think of menstrual flow as being repelled by Jesus' holiness? I don't get the transition. I guess <laughs> I'm asking for some demythologizing here, or your alternative to it. It really bugs me. I'm sorry, it kind of comes out. It always does. So that's a hard question. Um, the, the, the discussion about holiness and impurity might be different if instead of looking at the synoptic gospels, we did Paul or Acts or something else. But I wanted to talk about the God of the gospels and ask about Jesus. And, if, you know, students have asked me this, why does Jesus talk about the Pharisees so much? Why is Jesus always talking about the law? Well, guess what? This is the reality of his day in which ritual purity is a real thing. Now, I don't think the the answer or the transition is, is to import or transfer categories of ritual impurity to our world in exactly the way that Jesus did. But it's pretty clear Jesus thinks there are, and, and that's, I suppose, the value of Mark 7 and going back to the prophets who say, you know what really counts, let justice flow down like waters. You know, they, they make the same distinction between, uh, I think, <laughs> 
ritual impurity and, or uh, the ritual aspects of the faith, shall we say, and, and moral aspects. Now, I know that's viewed as a sort of modern, uh, con, you know, demarcation, but I think there's something there that's real. So when Jesus says, you know the things that really count, that really matter, that really defile, let's talk about those. And so when you get to Paul's letters, for example, and Corinthians and so on, he's no longer talking about ritual impurity, but he is talking about things that would have been ritually defiling, but he's talking about them under the category, like se sexual impropriety, which would have been morally in, uh, defiling, and that's what really counts for Paul. So I think the moves you see in the rest of the New Testament, um, and my colleagues in the room can help me out here, follow Jesus' emphasis on the things that are what I'm going to call morally, personally defiling. You know, when he reads off that list, boy, that gets pretty close to some of the vice lists that you get in the Pauline letters. You know, that list in Mark, uh, it's about sins of speech, sins of greed, uh, sexual impropriety, anger, you know, you name it, those things, that's, that's what gets carried over. So when, when you get First Peter or Paul or others talking about a holy people, uh, the saints of Corinth, um, uh, you, your body is a temple, all those kinds of things, they're the same kinds of concerns now that Jesus had in Mark 7 and that he has in the Sermon on the Mount and so on. So it seems that with the move of the church to, the, gen, to gen, the Gentile world, the system of ritual impurity, the practice of impurity was to a large extent left behind, but not the things that are still di differentiating between holy and unholy, clean and unclean. But yeah, but those are the gospel stories about Jesus. And I guess what I'm trying to ask is, how do they show us, what do they show us about, this is who Jesus thought God to be. It's kind of creepy for us, I suppose, to say, well, we don't. But if Jesus did, where's the, where's the story there? And, I, and that story of the, the transforming, outgoing power of holiness strikes me as still a powerful story, even if it's, if it's manifesting differently in our culture and times. It's very interesting to talk about these stories with, for example, Christians from India or other places as well, and just see how whole, whole you know, and having been through a pandemic and pure and impure and masks and all these washing your hands, it's all of a sudden, my goodness, now you get it. <laughs> This, at least you can get what it would have felt like in some ways, I suspect. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a stab I would make as a start. I, I don't have a question, but just a comment. And I want to say, first of all, I don't know anything about the New Testament except what I ask my wife at home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with respect to uh, church history and the issue of Catholic um, uh, approaches to holiness, and again, here I'm speaking more, mostly from my knowledge of medieval Catholicism, uh, your question, Steve, uh, dovetails with this because the, the admirable take on holy spaces, holy time, um, and holy rituals that someone like John Calvin was so uh, um, angered by, he would have seen as fundamentally two things. First of all, uh, it was just making stuff up, <laughs> which he was very unfond of. But that in itself was a transgression because it was it, uh, it effectively upstaged the holiness of God's word and God's ministry, and to some extent even God's ministers, because you know Geneva did have regulations about not uh, uh, not saying bad, not slandering your pastor, which of course never happens today. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, the downside though of of medieval the the trajectory of uh, holiness as, a, uh, as an ethos infusing practices, time, and so on in the early church is one that uh, implicitly drew on Le e either Leviticus or perhaps a caricature of, of, of a Levitical mindset, and it profoundly disadvantaged women, and it, was pr it, it quickly became prejudiced also against the same kinds of taboos, including menstrual impurity, uh, f with respect to women's ministries, but also male contact with women. So that uh, uh, handbooks for penance, handbooks for pastoral care, and handbooks for con hearers of confession are in incredibly detailed, uh, per, you know, prying into, you know, have you transgressed a kind of holiness that you would not have learned about from the New Testament, but you learned about it from you know, prevailing Catholic tradition. <laughs> 
It is interesting, though, when I take uh, students to Israel, they struggle with the kind of piety they see that they don't know what to do with people kissing the floor where Jesus might have been born. You know? <laughs> yes, sir. I have a, ooh, wow. I, I have a uh, kind of contextual question, okay. and, and then maybe a comment that even uh, goes into some of these things as well. It's like I, I'm struck by the fact that you have a pot up here, yeah. and that you're talking about, you know, it's like one of the first um, lectures that I've heard that actually will go into clean, unclean, common to holy that I've heard. And so it, it raises the question about why now in this space are people willing to re-ask these questions in ways that um, I think Protestants have shunned for such a long time. It's like, we're not going to talk about purity laws because that's bad. That's exclusionary. And, um, uh, but what, one of the things that I'm, uh, in some of my own dealing with purity laws in the Old Testament, I, I wonder, so I guess, so I have a question there, and then also we're wondering about a possible answer, is that I see some of the purity laws as maybe um, ecological, you know, and some of the, that there's this, this impulse about some distortions in the created order that lead to death rather than life, you know, and so skin breaking down, mm -hmm. um, you know, bodily fluids that symbolize mm -hmm. life leaking out of us and corpses, of course, mm -hmm. are dead, right? <laughs> you know, and so maybe there's a uh, uh, breaking down of some of our dualities between a moral and Pure, purity laws or something like that in some of our, like, um, our overcoming some of the dualisms between body and spirit that open us up again in some ways to revisit some of these, um, uh, some of these ways that Jesus is, is uh, dealing with bodies as well as um, morality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that I have anything to add to that, but I like the, the point of breaking down the duality of, you know, that, that we so often work with. I think people in the Bible live much closer to the earth, to daily life than we often do. You know, they, if someone dies, they have to deal with the dead body. They don't take it to a funeral home. You know, it's, it's there, it's a corpse, it's rotting in their midst. So yeah, there's, a, there's something I think uh, true there, helpful about what you say. Thompson, oh, there we go. I have a resource that I can add to the conversation on Mark 7. Uh, Dr. Logan Williams is publishing something in JBL on Mark 7, and I think he um, upholds the sort of King James version that, you, that you've put forward and, and pushes back on the, the reading that, that you've offered, um, and it's quite good. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to add to this conversation about ritual impurity, and, and um, there are a lot of things my mind is going all over the place, but one thing I wanted to add is that I think it's also important to note that um, a lot of these contact laws are inevitable, and as you say, they're, they're not representative of transgression necessarily, but there's something that just happened naturally. And in that way, they're also indicative of this other problem, which is just frailty and finitude. And so I think that gets, or that at least coheres with some of what you were saying, David, but I think it reminds us of yet another problem that God solves. And so that's more comment, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's Andy Sanders who writes, you have to realize most people would have been unclean most of the time. You, you know, it's, it's not like it was the odd thing, it was, it was the ordinary thing, but they dealt with it. it, 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 it but there it is. It's an a thing you. And if you go to Israel and see all the ritual baths, you will say they are doing this a lot. Because you know, you, you, this is what you have to do. But yeah, it's we we tend to we have tended, I think, to think of someone regarded as ritually as impure as everyone shunned, hated, ignored. They're sinners. They're, and it's not always like that. So I, th I thank you for that. I think that's a good reminder. One quick okay. question. I'm so sorry. Um, in this conversation about the name being profaned, I, also, I was trying to think of this as a kind of spectrum or at least a kind of duality, like uh, the name can be made profane and the name can be made holy. And so um, I appreciated very much your offhanded comment that um, making the name holy is like, you know, wood being made solid. I, I can't remember who you're quoting there. Thank you. But um, I do wonder though, um, if there is some sort of change or something in the command that, that prompts Jesus to ask us to pray it, what does it mean for the contagiousness 
of the holiness of God's name to be spread, as you say. Could you, I mean, does that cohere with some of what you're saying about the temple, um, the holiness of God kind of spreading into the world, things like that? Are, are you asking, Madison, if, if that's what the petition means? May your name be hallowed? Is that an, a prayer for spreading the holiness? Or can we connect it in that way? I wonder, what does it mean? You know, is there, is there a, ch a shift when we ask his name to be made holy? I'm not quite sure I get the shift. I mean, I, I, I find, and, and maybe David can illumine us all on this, but you know, the, God's name is holy, but it can be profaned and must be made holy again. So it's, in some ways it never ceases to be holy, but it, it can be profaned and must be made holy again. And that in itself is kind of head scratching, you know. Um, it, surely it's not just like this pot, you know, which can move in either directions. It's gotta be differentiated somehow. But I, I guess I would say, if I understand your question, uh, hallowed be thy name, it is very close to saying, God, do something so that the holiness of your name is known in the world, so that you are known in the world. It's very close to saying, transform us so that we will make your holy name holy in the world. So I, I see it that way. It's two, it's two petitions that comes out of Ezekiel, really, and then in elsewhere as well. But one, God says, you know, I'm going to do this because I'm the only one who has, and I don't really care about you. I love that line, you know. I'm doing this for my sake, but I'm doing it for you as well. I, I will transform my people. And I think that's all of goes, goes into what we are praying when we pray, hallowed be your name. Yeah. In, in what way? Uh, like, I think it's similar to your kingdom come, your will be done. God is king. May God's kingdom come. God's will be done like God's will is done. And yet, may God's will be done. And so I think it is focused on this sense of, I mean, the New Testament. I mean, sometimes my students ask me, like, oh, God in the Old Testament is, is so violent and terrible. And we love the God of the New Testament. And I say, yeah, the God of the New Testament is not different than the God of the Old Testament. The love in the New Testament is more emphasized, but it's because people can change. You know, the New Testament believes people have changed, not that God has changed, that there is a new potential for humanity, at least, you know, a new potential to be loving. And so I think the prayer is focused on, uh, yeah, it's more, more the anthropology, more, you know, how can humanity change? How can humanity be transformed? May we be the people who hallow God's name. May we be the place where God's kingdom comes, uh, where, where his will is done, and so on. Thank you. We'll take that as the final question and discussion. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Thompson for her contributions. And thank you to each of you for being here. We look forward to another round of lecture and discussion tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. So please do return if you're able to. God bless.